Thank you. Um, so welcome to our webinar series. And uh, we encourage you to actually register for the webinar series. I realize that some of you may have gotten the link um, through friends um, passing it on, which is great. Please do that. But we do encourage people to register for the series so that we can know who's out there and keep you in contact. And also, that will make sure that every week you get our email that conveniently gives you the link where you can find the recordings of the webinar. And this webinar, too, will be available um, in just a few hours after we finish. So with that sound check and slight introduction, um, let me introduce who we have here today. This is me. Uh, I am your moderator for today. I'll also be doing a little bit of the question and answer facilitation. And I am the uh, task manager for this webinar series here at the World Bank. We have Kristen uh, in the room next to me. She is making Adobe Connect run and work and do all these wonderful things, uh, assisted by Su Jung, who many of you know from past webinars. Uh, I hope that Army, I haven't quite seen her come on yet, but I hope we'll have our technical assistance person with us any minute now who can take care of any problems um, that you may post to her in the technical chat box. And we have Kirsten back once again as our very able uh, Q&A facilitator. And I will do my best to help her since um, Sean has been now elevated to our presenter. Our discussants today are my colleague Marcus, who's sitting in the office next to me. And hopefully, we'll be able to get Anthony um, from uh, Uganda on. But we've been having some problems with his uh, audio connection. So uh, we may or may not be able to hear from Anthony today. And our presenter is Sean Furry, who most of you know as our uh, facilitator each week, but of course is a water and sanitation specialist sitting in the um, RWS and Secretariat in Switzerland. Now, uh, as always, we like to find a little bit about uh, who's with us today. I can see that some of you have already started telling us uh, who you are. But if we could continue, I see we have Hadari from Dar es Salaam. Gus, Gus has become a faithful follower of our webinar series. Welcome back, Gus. Oh, somebody from the Philippines. Magdalena, welcome, welcome. And Enrico, also from Indonesia. From, we don't sometimes are missing our East Asia per, uh, participants because of the time difference. Minneapolis, don't get too many from Minneapolis. Oh, good, strong showing from Nairobi. Calgary, I don't, uh, not so familiar with this program, but I've been noticing we're getting a lot of Calgary participation. Bangalore, Bolivia, welcome. London, well, that's a pretty good um, turnout today from around the world. Welcome back, Richard. Um, uh, Kristen, could you tell us something about where we stand in terms of who's been registering uh, for our webinar series? Sure, we have uh, 12, 1,214 registra registered participants. And currently, we have 45 participants in the room. OK. Um, my experience tells me that number of 45 will jump a bit as people continue to log on. Could you also bring out um, today's poll? We always try and find out a little bit more about the participants from using our poll. And today, we'd like to find out how many of you are newcomers versus those of you that may have um, been with us for two, three, or even more times. So if you could bring out that poll, Kristen. If you could bring it out. Yes, there it is. Um, and please check the one that uh, applies to you. So you can check one if this is your very first webinar. And take it from there. So see a lot of first timers. But oh, that's great to hear. 10 people have already taken three or more. And some of all, maybe I should, let me check that too. I've been to all of them. So that put up our all statistic a bit. OK, well, that's um, for those of you that for this is the first one, welcome very much. And for all of the rest of you, we're so pleased to have you back. I think you can take away our poll now. Um, Kristen, and we will get on with the introductions. So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Sean. But first, I will tell you a little bit about uh, Sean's background. Sean's professional background is in hydrology, 
integrated water management, spatial and water resource planning, and environmental advocacy. He is a chartered water and environment manager and a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Sean holds a BSc in Environmental Sciences from the University of East Anglia and a Master's of Science in Infrastructure Engineering, Community Water Supply and Sanitation from Cranfield University. Um, and Cranfield, of course, we seem to have a, uh, quite a number of people joining us, so it must be a, a very good program. So Sean, um, let me turn it over to you. Kristen, you can take away my slides and bring out Sean's, and let's get started. Great. Muting my mic now. Over to you, Sean. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Or as they say here in Switzerland, good to meet you. Thank you for joining the webinar today. And thank you to those who have taken part throughout this series. And before I start, I'd like to give my deepest appreciation to Elizabeth and her team in the World Bank and to thank the speakers and discussants who have taken part in this series. So my presentation today is slightly different from the other webinars because I'm going to be giving an overview of sustainable groundwater development, which is one of the four RWSN themes. The aim of the talk is to give a bit of background to let you know what the network has been doing up until now. And it's an invitation to all of you to get involved in this exciting topic as we go forward. So to start, what are we facing? Well. Reusing groundwater for water supply is not a, good, a new idea. It is a very old idea that has been practiced around the world for centuries. The UN's joint monitoring program estimates that at least 650 million rural people are still using unimproved water sources. But the number on any particular day is probably much higher. Groundwater often seems like a great idea because the water is under our feet and it's protected from surface contamination by meters of soil and rock. The storage and buffering capacity of aquifers means that the water can be supplied even after a long period of no rain. All is needed is a hole and a water lifting device. What could be easier? Well, first is that drilling is often too expensive, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where a borehole can cost more than 10,000 US dollars. Secondly, Murphy's Law loves groundwater supply. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Boreholes get drilled badly, pumps break, boreholes and wells dry up or get contaminated. The net result is that even if an NGO, government or aid agency comes into a village, drills a well and fits a pump, there is a high chance that a few years down the line, if not sooner, the pump will break or the well will run dry and the water users will go back to the unsafe water sources that they were using before. So. In tackling this theme, we have looked at groundwater management as five slices of pie. The first is where the water comes from, the aquifer recharge. And managing this involves protecting watersheds and augmenting recharge, for example, using sand dams. The second is understanding groundwater resources, understanding how much is available, the quality, who is using it, and how much. And perhaps most importantly, resolving conflicts between different water and land users. The third segment is cost-effective boreholes. This is about digging wells and drilling boreholes that will provide sustainable water yields for rural water services. The next is hand pump technology, which is about having low-cost water lifting devices that are reliable and accessible. And last but not least are water users. The sustainable water services have to fit their needs and capacities, and planning and education is vital to prevent contamination of groundwater sources. In the current strategy period, RWSN is focusing on groundwater manage management, cost-effective boreholes, and hand pump technology. Of course, this theme is not working in isolation. We're working closely with the other three themes, accelerating self-supply, equity and inclusion, and management and support. We also need to be aware of other competing development priorities, such as agriculture and industrial development, some of which may help what we're doing, while others may make life more difficult through competing groundwater uses or pollution. We also need to remember that both human natural systems are not static. Human population and resource consumption is accelerating rapidly. And natural resources are vulnerable to these and to natural climatic variability and human-induced climate change. All of these factors make the 
the future is difficult to predict. So first I want to turn to hand pump technology. I'm doing this in a slightly odd order, but one that reflects the journey that the network has been on over the last 20 years. Hand pumps are where it all began. 20 years ago, in 1992, the hand pump technology network was founded. Its mission was to pull together worldwide expertise on hand pumps and develop international public domain standards. The most well known are the AFRIDEV and the India Mark 2 and 3. However, as you can see from the list, there are many more. As the network developed, it was realized that the problems and opportunities did not end with hand pump designs. And so the scope of the network expanded and the name changed to the Rural Water Supply Network. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that the work done to improve and standardize hand pump designs has had a lot of success. It is no exaggeration to say that millions of hand pumps have been manufactured and installed over the last 20 years all over the world from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. The AFRIDEV and India Mark II were successfully taken to scale, a feat that is often failed by other promising technologies in the wash sector. What, we can learn, what can we learn from this successful scaling up? Well, it largely came about because national governments like India, development partners like UNICEF, and a whole range of private sector and NGO partners coordinated their efforts. They created viable chains of supply and demand, and this fired up the hand pump manufacturing industry in India. Today, there are a lot of focus on the humble rope pump, which has been successful in Nicaragua and is now being scaled up by projects and programs worldwide. Sadly, though, not everything has been a success. The problem is elegantly captured in a short film called Everyone by Water for People. An organization comes in, drills a borehole, and donates a pump. The organization takes nice photos of children drinking clean water from the pump and uses the photos on their websites and annual reports. Everyone is happy until the pump breaks or the bowl hole runs dry. How common is this cliche? Sadly, it's been very common. An RWSN survey a few years ago shows the frighteningly bad failure rates. And for those that listened to Jonathan Annis's webinar on Madagascar, the situation he found there was even worse. Perhaps as many as two thirds of hand pumps are not working at any one time. This is all a shocking waste, but it's not news. Professor Carter looked at this, uh, these issues in his uh, opening webinar of the series. The focus of RWSN's work on these issues are being looked at through the management and support theme, which is being led by IRC. And a couple of weeks ago, we heard from uh, Katrina Fonseca about the wash cost project, which is making great progress at looking at some of these wider issues of uh, life cycle costing and management. So instead, what does this mean for the hand pumps themselves? Well, I think it's important to make sure that they're made tougher, made cheaper, made locally, and mend mended locally, to improve supply chains, to improve information chains, to get user feedback to improve the product. To expand on the last points, the most important with most projects, there is a relationship between the user buyer and the manufacturer. If the user doesn't like a product, they won't buy it, or they might complain, or take legal action against the supplier or manufacturer. If I buy a car and it breaks within a year, I take it back to the dealer. If I buy a bo box of breakfast cereal and it's moldy, I take it back to the shop and get another. If I buy a detergent and it doesn't clean, I don't buy that brand again. In the digital age, it is possible to have an immediate communication link between buyers and sellers through email, contact forms on websites, Facebook groups, or reviews left on internet shopping sites like Amazon or eBay. Whatever the means, the manufacturer gets feedback about what is good or bad about their product. And they, if they want to stay in business, then they will listen to their customers and make their product or service better. Hand pump retail doesn't seem to work like this. There seems to be a market failure. The water user rarely buys the hand pump they use. If it goes wrong, or they want something improved or added, there is no feedback mechanism to the manufacturer. And there can be perverse incentives. If the NGO or government agency buys hand pumps at the lowest price and doesn't really scrutinize the quality of what they're buying, then they often 
don't have enough of a stake if it, if it goes wrong. If there isn't an informed customer, then there is a disincentive for manufacturers to improve the quality of their product, because why would a manufacturer want to increase their costs and reduce their sales? Hand pump procurement is an important area that I think deserves more scrutiny, and I would welcome your ideas and experiences. Training and skills with hand pump technology is vital. It's not rocket science, but without care, even the simplest hand pump can get broken by ignorance. The pictures you can see here are from a hand pump training course run by the Austrian Red Cross each year. It would be great to see resources like this used more. One of the teachers pictured here is Eric Baumann, one of the founders of RWSN and the driving force for so many years behind hand pump technology and this network. Briefly, I want to tell you a story about Rowan. He's an Australian working with the Nile Centre for Appropriate Technology in Sudan. He came to us, he actually visited our offices in St. Gallen, to tell us about the problems that he had seen across Sudan with India Mark II pumps. The flanges on the water tanks kept breaking, as illustrated in this picture. We sent an email to our team of hand pump experts, and they replied telling us of similar experiences, particularly in Sudan. There are a number of possible reasons for this happening, but if it's poor workmanship or materials, then how can we incentivize better quality standards of manufacture? I use this example to show that hand pump design and manufacture is not a completed process that we don't have to give any thought to anymore. There is still work to do and we still need to ensure that hand pump design standards are living and continue to evolve and improve. Next I turn to cost effective boreholes. Drilling is more than just about having a big rig and going out and knocking holes into the ground. But cost effective isn't about being cheap, it's about using the right tools for the job. If you have a shallow aquifer and you want to fit a $100 suction hand pump, why would you spend $5,000 hiring a huge truck based rig when you can just get two guys with an auger to do it for less than $50? Cost effective boreholes is about professionalizing the water well drilling sector so that those who commission wells and boreholes get a better deal. Equally, it is in important that drillers are able to make a good livelihood for themselves and create employment but do so without exploiting their clients. Drillers who don't understand costing and pricing and contract side of their business will soon find themselves out of business. All countries need a healthy drilling sector where everyone wins. The Cost Effective Boreholes program has been ongoing for seven or eight years now and I recommend that you download and have a look at the range of publications and field notes on this topic. All are concise and well illustrated because we want them to be read. The heart of cost effective boreholes is the code of practice. The code of practice has nine principles, which I don't have time to go through in detail, but you can see them here on this slide. What is important to note is that drilling activity is just part of the process. Information recording and communication is vital. This process is about developing drilling teams that have the right mix of technical and business skills to be able to do their jobs properly. It is about an informed client who knows what to look for and what questions to ask. The third and final segment that we're looking at over the next three years is notionally called cost-effective groundwater development. It's new and we may come up with a better name. The objective is to develop and promote affordable ways of preventing pollution of drinking water sources, preventing over abstraction and declining groundwater levels, and avoiding and mediating conflicts between water users. You may be thinking, aha, what about IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management? Well, IWRM definitely has a role, but in the WaterAid Oxfam ICE report called Managing Water Locally, the argument is made that a lot of IWRM work is too high level and intangible and that what is needed is a more localized approach. There are already some examples of approaches out there. For example, community-based water resource management by WaterAid, uh, water use management plans by Helvetas, payment for watershed services, uh, various organizations including Forest Trends, and the GWP uh, toolbox by the Global Water Partnership. What we're looking for in RWSN is what approaches do, 
do these uh, do these offer for managing groundwater resources for rural water supply? And can we use some combination of these or come up with something new? So, to summarise, the sustainable groundwater development theme of RWSN is focusing on three areas, each of which has the different challenges. Hand pump technology. This is a success story of scaling up but standards need to be maintained and the quality needs improvement. Cost-effective boreholes. The tools are ready for use, but they need scaling up to professionalize the water well drilling sector. And cost-effective groundwater management. Our question is what needs to be done? And we're still at an early stage here. So finally, here are the projects in the RWSN work plan. But as you can see, most of it is currently unfunded. There is a foundation of 20 years work and so we're looking forward to working with you to take forward some of these exciting initiatives over the next three years. If you want to get involved in the discussions or keep up to date with any of the topics that you've heard about today or meet fellow rural groundwater enthusiasts, you can do so on the Sustainable Groundwater Development subcommunity of RWSN on D groups. Now thank you for listening. Please uh, visit our website, which will, I promise, be uh, upgraded very soon. We're having some delays there, but it's, it's nearly ready to go. Um, to download the presentation that this publication is based on. Yeah, publication that this presentation is based on, even. So, and also to be aware that in September, there will be an e-discussion on uh, groundwater development, and details will be sent out via the D-Group's mailing list. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand back to Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, can, uh, Kristen, can you bring back my slides so I can continue to and introduce our discussants for the day, um, who's not Sean. But um, the first discussant is Market, Marcus Wingen, who is my colleague here at the World Bank and a senior water resources management specialist. Uh, before coming to the bank, Marcus worked for more than 20 years in the field of water resource management at the national, regional, and transboundary levels. He has a specific focus in his work on groundwater resource evaluation, management, and protection. He has worked in a large number of countries in Asia, Middle East, Europe, and Latin America. At the World Bank, he is in charge of our water expert team facility that provides high-level technical support to water World Bank water projects worldwide, and he also leads our work, that is our work here at the bank, on groundwater governance. Marcus holds a Master's of Science degree in hydrogeology from the Free University in the Netherlands. Netherlands. Marcus, over to you. Don't forget to unmute your mic. Yes, uh, so hello everybody, and thanks. Um, Liz, for your introduction. I would like to uh, thank Sean for the very informative uh, presentation he has given us uh, today. I think in a, in a very short time, Sean has touched on uh, very critical problems. And I think many of us have uh, come across some or all of the problems he has uh, mentioned in his presentation. And uh, indeed, we, we know from, from many years of practice that uh, the sustainability of, uh, of rural water supply infrastructures, they do not only depend on, uh, it doesn't stop when we install successfully a borehole. It, uh, the real challenge comes in the, in the years after when we see them uh, gradually falling apart and breaking down. So it is indeed very much about um, the sustainability of the, I mean, the technical sustainability and uh, the sustainability of the resource, but also very much about financial sustainability and about finding mechanisms to, to ensure that there is uh, not only the local capacity to repair hand pumps, but also the capacity to, uh, to finance those repairs. So in the ideas that Sean presented to us, uh, there were two that I found particularly uh, interesting, and uh, the, the the suggestion to have uh, better feedback 
on products, I think it's really essential. And indeed, uh, if we have um, projects, the choice of hand pumps should not be based only on the cheapest uh, option. So I think the idea of having feedback on products, uh, my question would be, is there a way to centralize that information? And for example, we have studies about um, the success rate of hand pumps in, in a number of countries. So is there a way to centralize that information and to centralize information about the robustness of the equipment and the, the success rate of the equipment after one, three, five years? And maybe we could have a kind of a central database and the, the success rate of hand pumps should be something that we consider when we award contracts for, for, for installing new hand pumps. The other idea that I liked uh, very much in Sean's presentation is what you presented in the end, the cost-effective groundwater management. Um, it is true that what, whether we call it IWRM or groundwater governance or it requires uh, lots of layers of um, uh, action. We need uh, organizations at national levels and we all know that it takes time to have those mechanisms and institutions installed and the idea of indeed not waiting for this kind of national or regional institutions to be in place uh, to stop taking action. I think that would that's really interesting. So to uh, let's start taking action at the local level and not wait for national institutions to be to be ready. So the, to develop a set of of local measures to improve groundwater protection and to improve groundwater management. I think it's something we can all together work on. Uh, I think at the bank we are trying to in a number of projects to to, to bring together that kind of information and to share it with um, with partners from other organizations, uh, I think it will be helpful for everybody. So I think that's something we can focus on uh, also in the years to come. So thanks a lot, Sean, for those uh, interesting and uh, stimulating ideas. And I give the mic back to Liz. Thank you. It, it took me a minute there to unmute my mic, so sorry for the slight delay there. Okay, now we are going to see if we can connect the microphone of Anthony Lutu. Um, Kristen, could you please uh, make sure that the, or, or Anthony, could you connect your microphone while I'm doing the introduction? This may or may not um, work, but let me tell you about Anthony, uh, even if it tr turns out to be impossible uh, to connect him um, via his microphone. Anthony is sitting in Uganda, in Kampala. He has a master's degree in water and environmental management from ITC in the Netherlands. He has worked in the water sector in Uganda for 20 years, where he has been involved in groundwater investigations, groundwater development, and exploitation, groundwater development and exploitation through boreholes. Anthony was one of the authors for the RWSN publication on the costing and pricing of drilling. And you see a screenshot of the publication here, and Sean has already given you a link uh, to it. Anthony is the principal consultant for Aquatech Enterprises in Uganda, a consultancy firm in water resources activities and where he manages drilling activities. So Anthony, uh, can you please give your discussant remarks? And if we can't hear you, then we'll unfortunately have to move on. I'm turning the microphone over to you, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice uh, presentation done by Sean. And uh, I think he touched the very uh, important uh, aspects of uh, sustainable groundwater development. Uh, I think key issues are issues of functionality, where we may all be knowing that uh, generally, for example, in Africa, where we are using a lot of boreholes, the functionality is very low because uh, after putting up these wells, they break down, and uh, sometimes they break down so fast, so that means that uh, they are not, uh, you, you don't have, they are not cost-effective in some cases. Uh, that was a key issue. 
Uh, he also raised up, I think there is an issue about poor quality of, for example, of the sometimes the pumps themselves, although there has been a move to make sure that the technology of the pumps improve, but uh, the pumps which generally come to countries where which are using basically groundwater, the developing world, some of them are not up to the quality, and the, therefore the pumps, both the installation materials like the pipes, sometimes break down so fast, meaning that uh, they are not cost effective. They don't last long, although drilling basically costs a lot to put down these infrastructures. Um, I think you also uh, mentioned something to do with the aquifer protection, which I found important. Uh, you can look at it vis-a-vis -vis the increasing population. As we all know, the world population is increasing, but we also know that we need to we need water, but we also need the food. So uh, that's an area where we have a bit of a problem, because in order to protect the aquifer, you need to ensure that you have the land, to, these catchments are protected, but at the same time you need to, to, to have the food where in some of these aquifers you are actually using uh, fertilizers, you are actually using, which at the end of the day will contaminate the aquifers. So I think these broader issues are key issues which we all need to think about and look at and see how best they can be handled. You are looking at food on one side, then you are looking at water on the other side. You are looking at uh, the population increasing. Now, I can also say that uh, these uh, boreholes can be the groundwater usage and exploitation through boreholes can only be cost effective if it can last long. Uh, if these boreholes cannot last long, then of course they are, you cannot uh, call them cost effective. I know, for example, here in Uganda, the issues of functionality, we have the functionality is about 70%, 75%, meaning that at any one time, you have about 25% of the, the water sources not working. And that is not only this country, but in many countries. And I think it is something all of us who are interested in this, who are in the sector of water, try to see how we can basically improve the, 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 the usage and the functionality of the water. Now, I can also mention another thing about in some of the areas, for example, in Africa, you find that groundwater is so deep that the technology of hand pump is really difficult to, to use. While you, for example, in Uganda, you go to areas like Karamoja, that is in the north uh, western corner, you find that the boreholes there are very deep, reaching about 100 meters or so. Sometimes the static water level is 80 meters, and therefore you find that in such cases, you have problems in exploiting or extracting the groundwater. Therefore, it becomes not a resource which is easily available in areas where it is so vital and so necessary. I want again, once again to thank Sam for that wonderful uh, view of all these important aspects. And uh, I want now to return the microphone for a while to examine. Thank you, Anthony, and I'm so glad that we managed to make the technology work so that we could uh, bring you into this webinar. Uh, so now we're coming to our question and answer uh, period. Some, we've been keeping track of your questions and answers there. Kirsten, will you bring out our uh, Q&A pod? Um, we will, uh, and could you resize this so that we can read all of the um, questions in there? We'll be bringing out your questions one at a time for um, uh, Sean and Anthony and Marcus to comment on. So Sean, here's the first one for you. It's from Joe Gummy, I think it's pronounced. Um, there are potential contradictions on where next. Making it tougher and cheaper is usually not making it locally. And then I also asked you to comment in this respect on a very different argument or a very different approach that Terry Barbot made in his earlier webinar. 
Over to you, Sean. Great, thank you. Um, I think this is this is a really important question that's quite central to um, hand pump technology and probably why there isn't one single hand pump design um, because it it depends a lot on the what what are the critical sustainability factors in a particular context. Um, so, for example, if if you're somewhere in in Sudan or or somewhere that's quite quite remote uh, and the groundwater is very deep, then chances are you're going to need a, a very robust uh, pump, which you might not be able to ma manufacture uh, locally, and therefore. If, you, if the quality of the pump needs to be of the highest standard, then uh, to, make, to make it work at, for any length of time, then maybe importing it rather than manufacturing locally is the more sustainable option. In another, uh, in another situation where maybe you have quite a high population density that's quite a shallow aquifer, then you can probably get away or use a, a less robust pump, such as a, a rope pump or uh, a number six or something like that that is can be made of local materials can be repaired using local materials um, and and it's if if it breaks down more frequently that's okay as long if the uh, if the spare parts are, are are available and the skills are available to to make those repairs um, so it's it, yeah it's it's tricky and that that's probably where it links to to Thierry's um, uh, point about wh whether it should be a, a, a globalized industry or a localized industry. I think it will depend on 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 the context and which works better. If you have uh, quite a sparsely populated um, uh, population with tough groundwater conditions, or if you have a, a dense population. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, let me just go on to the, the next question. In fact, this is really, I would say, first of all to Sean and then to Anthony, so if you could both be quite brief. Question from Fatumata Sangari, one of our regular listeners. Um, how do you measure cost effectiveness of boreholes? And Richard Carter from Watery the UK points out that cost effectiveness is about reducing costs while not compromising on construction quality. But Fatimata is still not completely happy and wants to know really how do you measure that. So could I hand over to you, Sean, and then could you hand over to Anthony? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, in terms of measuring it, I think one of the points that Anthony made about about uh, how long does it take before a borehole fails, and from his experiences, uh, I'm sure he was saying that that sometimes boreholes and hand pumps fail really quite quite quickly, and if you're Using the wrong drilling technology, or uh, for the situation, then then that's what's going to happen. Um, yeah, it's quite tricky. I'm not a driller, so I, I don't don't really don't really know in in detail. But it, it seems to me that it's about matching the right drilling technique uh, and the right drilling approach with with what the job actually demands. So over to Anthony. Anthony, don't forget you have to unmute your microphone before you speak. We all make this mistake. But if you could unmute your microphone and offer your comments on this question. Thank you. Well, it seems yeah. like we've lost Anthony. Um, oh, this are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm there. I'm here. Now, Cost effectiveness of a borehole, basically you look at the population it serves, how many people is it serving if you are making it, how long will it last, what is its initial cost. Because if a borehole, for example, in this country, in Uganda, where a borehole cost between around 8,000 to 10,000 US dollars, now if it can only last for a few months or, or, or years, then I don't think it is cost effective to have it because it's unique. You do not have meant its initial cost. So we are, in my opinion, we are talking about measuring cost effective by looking at its initial cost, the time it takes, 
uh, to, to, to stay serving a particular population. And for example, how many, uh, what type of population, how many people it is serving. Of course, in order to have it cost effective, it must be constructed very well. The drilling part of it is very well, and therefore the, the materials you also use to install in it must be of the right quality. Uh, back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you very uh, yes. much. Um, the yes. next question is, yes, is also for uh, Anthony, which is uh, Fatumata Sangari again asks how, about how do you monitor borehole functioning? And Richard Carter made a few remarks about how this can be done. Um, but I asked also about the suggestions that had been made in earlier webinars by Grunfoss and Vernier. So uh, Anthony, I know you weren't here for earlier webinars, so maybe you could take the initial um, response to this. And then Sean, uh, it, could you add anything else that um, you may have to say based on our earlier webinars? Thanks. Over to you, Anthony. Uh, this is one of the things we have been uh, carrying out, for example, in Uganda. How do you monitor functioning? At a particular time, uh, you send out technicians, like Richard Carter said, you send out people to find out how many wells are being used. And therefore, if you know how, ma how many wells are not functioning at a particular moment. Therefore, when you know this, then you get to know the functionality of the boreholes. And it, basically, there is no, apart from sending out people, there are committees. You can form committees around these water sources in the rural areas. And therefore, these committees, they can inform the central office that is at the local government level, call them district in, in Uganda. Then those ones at any one time will know that in such communities, so many communities, the wells are not functioning. So the easiest and the cheapest is to try and to have the committees at the water source. And therefore, those committees, since they need to be assisted in making their wells function, they will inform the central office. And therefore, you will be able to know that the wells are not functioning. Back to Elizabeth. Um, right, Thank just, you. In just fact, just I'm going to it over to you. Oh, yeah. sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add to that um, about the, the interesting tools that have been developed by uh, WaterAid and also by Aqua and Water for People on water point mapping using uh, mobile phone technology. And uh, I've been talking to the guys at Aqua um, in the Netherlands because they're taking on the development of Flow, which is this uh, field level operations um, tool. And the, as the, the tool is set up at the moment, it's about when people are out in the field and they visit a water point, they can report uh, the, the functionality of that water point and report that back using their mobile phone. It goes off to the internet and the central database, which is a very interesting uh, technology. But what would be perhaps even more useful would be to get some idea through that survey data of what is going wrong. Um, not just that the, that the hand pump is broken, but what is broken on the hand pump. Because it's that kind of feedback information that we need to get back from the field to get a view to uh, a greater idea of are there, are there problems more to do with the, the boreholes being badly made, or are they due to the uh, hand pumps being badly used, or are they due to bad um, design uh, or bad hand pump manufacture. So uh, that I, this is where I come back to the point um, that data is, is really important, getting that information uh, back from the users so that we can uh, improve the product. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, this is another question. Really, I'm going to put this to you, Sean, having just come back from the, the course that was done in, um, in Austria by the Red Cross. And there's actually been a lot more than these three comments in the box. Um, our friend from the Netherlands starts with saying that some manufacturers claim that the pump does not break down. Is this possible? And Richard Carter emphatically answers no. And then we have Lon 
Dono asking about the lifespan of a regular hand pump. There's been much more going on in the chat box, but could you say something about this breakdown of pumps and hand pump lifetime, please, Sean? Yeah, sure. Um, well, certainly I, I agree with Richard on this one. I mean, anything, absolutely anything, it defies the laws of physics that, that nothing will break down. Um, so maybe the manufacturer should re refine their claim to won't break down within a certain period or that they offer a warranty as, as most uh, manufacturers do. So um, this is why with, with, any, with any technology there needs to be uh, robust data to support any claims uh, that, that anyone makes that's uh, independently verified. Um, I think on the lifetime of hand pumps it varies on the design, it varies on the on the materials used. It uh, varies on the, on the conditions and how many users. Um, and there are some sort of basic back of the envelope um, uh, sort of calculations. And I uh, noticed that 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 Elmar from the Red Cross is 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 uh, logged online, so he'll be waiting keenly for me to have memorised what uh, he and his team taught me a few weeks ago. And I I have, must admit that I can't remember the exact formula, so I apologise to him. And um, uh, but it's it can be in the order of of, of months if it's badly installed uh, to hopefully uh, five, ten, fifteen years if it's pro properly maintained. But it, it it depends on a whole range of of factors that's quite difficult to predict, and that's why you should always be careful of any manufacturer's claims. Oh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Anthony, there's a question for you coming in from Laura Olmsted, working with the UniWater Education in Calgary, about the need for uh, whether there's a need for more hydrogeologists in sub Saharan Africa. And then, Richard. Carter has added a, a question or a comment about the need for more construction supervision. If you'd look, care to answer these questions and respond to this comment? Yes. I can say yes, absolutely. We need the more qualified and well-trained hydrogeologists to deal with the uh, uh, scarce uh, water resources in the sub-Saharan -Sah Africa. We realize also that uh, where our groundwater is is in the sub sub Saharan Africa is in rocks which need investigations. You need to do a very good supervision and currently I think in the continent we don't have enough hydrogeologists to do the supervision of uh, the construction of boreholes, making them to ensure that they are they are properly done. Actually I agree with him. We need we actually do need. Thank you, Elizabeth. Back to you. Thank you very much, Anthony. And in fact, it's interesting because we've now got a new link between Laura um, in um, Calgary and Keith Kennedy. They're really looking at ways they could maybe collaborate. So that's very exciting to see live um, potential collaboration and ways of building capacity. You're a very popular man, Anthony. So the next question we have is coming to you. And you can tell us something about your experience. Um, would you agree that the material of the hand pump and riser pipes determines the successfulness of a borehole? in terms of its functionality. IPA procures strictly stainless steel for our clients, and we've been doing so for over 15 years. What about making this material a standard for the pump? So what's your opinion? And Richard Carter, who's very active today, um, comments back to Barry saying he agrees. There's lots of corrosive groundwater. So over to you, Anthony. Anthony, you need to unmute your microphone. Sorry. <laughs> you could just unmute, then we can hear your wise words of wisdom. We still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Elizabeth, now, uh, yes, can uh, you help? sorry for that. Uh, I'm saying great. that yes, I would agree uh, strongly that the the um, uh, handy pump uh, sustainability or the success of. Hello, I'm back. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Hello. Go ahead. You're doing fine. Hello, can you hear us? I, I must say that um, uh, the success of the or sustainability of boreholes is so much dependent on the materials installed in them. These razor pipes and the, uh, the rods, if they are not of the good quality, then of course the boreholes won't last long. And also, we should know that the, in many sources, the water is a little acidic or sometimes a little bit corrosive. And therefore, if the quality of materials is not good enough, then the boreholes will keep on or breaking down. So the materials must be of the right quality, and each country has its own uh, standards based on the nature of the water they have. Um, whether the, we need to use the stainless steel, whether it can last for long, uh, that is something which needs to be checked because I remember under the large project in Uganda, the Ruasa project, where we had some steel, stainless steel pipes used, some of them also ended up being corroded in some areas and they couldn't last long enough. But generally, of course, stainless steel pipes would, do, would be much better than the galvanized iron razor pipes. Uh, that's uh, basically what I can say for now. Uh, Elizabeth, back to you. Um, thank you very much. We have the next question for Sean. Uh, there were quite a few uh, comments on this point, as, as you can see. But if, Sean, you could just um, give a, a statement about what you see as the relationship or balance between technology, on the one hand, and soft factors such as community involvement in regard to sustainability. Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I would say that a, a lot of it inf uh, emphasis in, in recent years has um, been, certainly at the, re the research level seems to have been on, on soft factors on the community involvement, community engagement, which is absolutely essential and, and key. And we see that within uh, a lot of the work, particularly by IRC at the moment through the Triple S program and, and Washcast. Um, my worry with in regard to hand pumps in particular is that the technology side seems to have fallen away a bit and it seems to be regarded by by many as kind of a job done tick in the box uh, and move on um, and th there's a danger that the the, the public domain standards uh, for um, pumps like the the Afri Devon India Mark II will just get left left behind and and not in, improved and, and kept alive so it as always, it's about balance, and the, and the pendulum swings one way and t'other. So um, I, I would like to see uh, just a little bit smidgen more uh, on the on the technology side uh, for for hand pumps. Um, but I think in in terms of uh, the groundwater management side, I think that there's a lot to do in in terms of the the, the social side and um, the engaging with with uh, stakeholders and one of the bits of work that I'm doing at the moment is I'm doing a project for the Ministry of Water and Environment in, in Uganda um, on water source protection and that could be taken as a very technocentric approach where you do lots of catchment modeling and you impose lots of regulations and and you stick up fences and you kick people off land um, but I think what will actually have much more success is is a, is a balanced approach where um, you're really taking, uh, including everyone within the, the catchment of that water source, and you're working to resolve conflicts around uh, soil erosion and, and issues like that, and uh, open defecation, so that you get to a situation where where there are win-wins. And if there aren't win-win situations, then maybe you can use tools such as payment for watershed services to um, make sure that. Uh, those who are taking action to uh, protect a water source are, uh, get, are compensated for, for their actions. So that's my uh, that's my take on that. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Sean, for that very clear, extensive answer. Um, the next question we have here, we're really looking at you know, water quality issues, and I'm going to actually put this to Marcus. Um, maybe you could tell us something about your experiences. And um, Abdul Jaffer, um, another regular participant here, 
points out that by and large groundwater is bacteriologically safe but often it contains chemical contaminants. In Bangladesh, the shallow aquifer seems to be contaminated with arsenic, but the deep aquifer system is free from such contamination. Water quality is therefore important to look at the outset. And maybe you'd like to add something around water quality and experiences, Marcus. Over to you. Yes, uh, I think um, the water quality question is uh, Marcus, we can't hear Marcus. you. Um, now it's better, I hope. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, the groundwater quality question, I think, is uh, partly linked to the broader question of information on groundwater, on groundwater data. But if we take a look at groundwater quality in general, I think we have very, a very, very large number of different situations. I mean, we have the quality as being a, a result of some uh, human-induced pollution. It can be uh, bacteriological pollution near the hand pumps. There can be pollution from other activities, from uh, from industrial activities, etc. But we do have also a large number of areas that are somehow affected by some kind of basically natural type of pollution. Arsenic is one example, of course, uh, and it, we find it in many areas in the world. Bangladesh and Bengal in India are some examples. But besides the arsenic, we have other types of pollutions which have uh, similar processes like uh, fluoride pollution in many countries. We have even uh, radioactive contamination in a number of aquifers. So it, in these cases, to deal with that pollution requires to have sufficient understanding of the groundwater system of the aquifers and lots of pollutions of this natural type of pollution can be uh, reduced or avoided by well tapping the right layers or uh, avoiding uh, wells uh, maybe contaminating uh, adjacent uh, groundwater layers so unless we have a better knowledge of the groundwater systems and better information about not only the quantity but also the quality, it will be difficult to to manage them um, uh, properly. And um, I don't know if we, I, I saw there were some questions also dealing with the, um, with the data on groundwater. I don't know if uh, you want to deal with them right away. Uh, Kirsten? That's the next question. That's the next question. Okay. Uh, so then uh, my final word on the quality is that it, it is a, a basically uh, a knowledge question. I mean, knowing to avoid pollutions is, is one thing. And uh, knowing how to, to tap the, 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 the good groundwater layers and avoid the, the, the polluted ones is, is, is another question. And obviously, we have areas where there seems to be little choice, where there is either no water or polluted water. And then we are in. Well, in, in, in small scale treatment options, but it, it, it becomes then also a financial question. Um, thank you very much, Marcus. So uh, as, as you noted, there's been quite a bit going on in the chat box about central groundwater databases. So uh, can I now ask you to expand on your remarks um, about that, Marcus, and then Sean, if you would care to make any. Uh, additional remarks. These two comments were specifically about um, RWSN um, or building a database or um, the one that exists by SADC. Over to you, Marcus, and then Sean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with uh, with Joe and Keith. I mean, the the data groundwater data. Uh, question is, is a really extremely critical point. Uh, at the World Bank, we recognize that as well. And the it seems to be it's often that we are turning around in circles and that we problems we, foc we, we noticed already 20 years ago that we still haven't found the right way to deal with it. Um, data collection, it, there is a kind of a paradox. If you need to have some weather data, they are in most places uh, easily to find. As soon, if you look for data on surface water, you may find them, maybe a little bit more difficult. But if you look for data on groundwater, it really becomes very difficult. And 
there is this kind of paradox where groundwater systems are three-dimensional and often more complex than surface water systems, but the amount of data we have on groundwater are, in most cases, much less than on surface water. So there is a kind of a contradiction. And while analyzing this problem, the World Bank did a number of uh, case study analysis to, to find out why it remains so difficult to have continuous data and reliable data on groundwater. And then you see a very uh, different picture in a number of countries, because if we talk about data on groundwater, we talk about data on the use and the users, and we talk about data on the, the resource, and the resource means both the quality and the quantity aspects. But one of the critical issues in many countries appears to be that there is a lack of uh, dedicated financing for data collection and data storage and to, to maintain these mechanisms. And if we have a lack of financing, it is very often linked to the fact that we have lack of dedicated institutions. And so this is uh, an aspect where at the bank we have come more or less to a conclusion that we even if we all want uh, integrated water resource management uh, to happen and to be the goal, we think that to get integrated water resource management, we have first to build stronger institutions for groundwater monitoring and groundwater data. So we see several interesting international initiatives. Uh, Keith mentioned IGREG and obviously also the, the SADC, the, the newly set up groundwater data center is, is very promising and I, I think there are many initiatives in, in a number of countries and the, the idea would be to, to somehow link them rather than building maybe a separate international groundwater database, promote those local initiatives, I mean regional as in the case of the IGC center in South Africa and make sure there is data exchange, there is um, they are linked to some network of initiatives, like uh, IGREC is now part of the UNESCO uh, uh, set of institutions. So, uh, and then promoting better financing and better institutions in countries to have the data that are critical um, for the groundwater management. Okay, so far, so now it's over to Sean, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I would, I would mark as I would agree with your point so heartily, there needs to be strong national and international systems for uh, groundwater data as there are for meteorological and, and climate data. Um, and my, I started my career as a young hydrologist in, in hydrometry, both collecting and, and analyzing groundwater and um, surface water data. So. I know how important it is um, and how important quality is because data quality is absolutely critical and it's very difficult um, to get right and it's quite often done done badly. Um, and that those pro if there's problems with the fundamental data, then those errors just propagate up the up the food chain, so to speak. So um, those those agencies and authorities involved with um, uh, groundwater data collection just need much higher uh, value uh, at attached to what they're doing, and much higher uh, sort of visibility of, of of the role that they they need. In terms of um, RWSN, I would say that uh, there's a very limited role that we can have in terms of groundwater data because uh, we just don't have the capacity, but also because groundwater is much broader than just rural water supply. It affects um, all, all sectors, uh, particularly agriculture, industry, urban areas. Um, so I think what, what we can do is to input into these national and international debates on what are the key indicators that, that we need to know about uh, as, a, as a sort of sector or subsector um, to enable um, effective planning of, of rural water supply schemes. So there, there are issues around um, quantity and, and quality um, to make sure that if there are boreholes put in, uh, that they're put in in the right areas. Um, and of course, the, the finer the scale that the, that mapping can be done, the, the better, because it's 
it's all too easy to look at uh, look at a, a map and assume that that's based on on a dense collection of, of real data in actual fact it might be just I interpreted from quite a few uh, quite just not very many um, boreholes and data points and so the error uh, chances of errors are, are quite high um, yeah so back back to base thank you very much Sean um, in fact that leads nicely to the next question and just to let you know there are are probably about 15 more questions that have been asked, so we're not going to be able to get through all of them. But I see many of you are replying to each other in the chat box, which is fantastic. Um, but the next question relates back to data as well, because drilling supervision is really important to, to be able to collect data. And there's a question for you, Anthony. And um, I know we've sat in your office many times and talked about struggles and challenges of drilling supervision. So Kenneth asks, or he points out a caution regarding construction supervision. An inspector, as he calls him, without good experience can cause more problems than solutions. Most people with the requisite experience are doing the work, not watching it. Would you like to say something on drilling supervision, Anthony? And don't forget, yeah, your mic's on, brilliant. Yes. Uh... Uh, what he's saying is actually uh, uh, true uh, on one line. Uh, supervision is so vital for the lifespan of any uh, water sources, groundwater source. If you don't have a good supervision, then the construction may not be done well. And that has been on uh, in many areas. But I think the important thing is that the supervisor must, of course, have experience must have knowledge on what he uh, is doing, and uh, he must not just watch things going wrong and be just an inspector. I think a, a good inspector is not is not a supervisor. Supervision should be different from just inspection, because if you are not uh, ensuring that the specification is which are clearly specified, which vary basically from country to country, are adhered to, then of course your water source won't last long enough. So I still say that supervision is very vital and crucial. It will help you to have your water source sustainable or last long, and you need a good, experienced person to ensure that that is done. Uh, back to you, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Anthony. Kirsten and I are playing a bit of a tag team. That's why you're never exactly sure who's going to be coming on next. Um, Laura from the program at Calgary basically made an, an informational posting on the chat box about uh, their programs looking for uh, partners in to host a uh, Master's of Science program in water resources in sub-Saharan Africa. And I, of course, encourage people to um, respond in the chat box if they know anything in addition about this and to, to take Laura's um, web page down. But Sean, do you have any suggestions offhand of universities that might make good hosts for a Master of Science program in water resources? And, uh, and Marcus as well? So I'll turn it over to Sean if you have anything to say on that, and then Marcus. Uh, well, in in terms of water resources, that's that's slightly tough. The, the certainly the two um, the two main masters in the in the UK are the ones run by Cranfield University and Weddock University of uh, Loughborough, which which are well known. Um, uh, else elsewhere, I'm not, I'm less clear to be honest. I'm not I'm not uh, up to speed with with what's hot and what's not in terms of academic. Water resources, so sorry, can't be much help with that one. Yeah, um, for me it's uh, a bit the same. I I wouldn't be able to give a a, a well balanced answer on which would be the good or the, the better ones. Uh, so maybe given the number of participants we have, uh, uh, we may get some feedback from today's participants, and uh, they may be better placed than me to to give some suggestions. Thank you, Marcus and Sean, on, on that. Um, 
I think there's a lot more going on than we realise, and one of the good things about these webinars and also the new D groups is we can really start to see who's doing what. Um, oops, I've copied the wrong part of the question. One second, please. The, the next question is kind of to, to Sean, and, and part of it I'll, I'll kind of chip in a little bit from this side. Ryan asks, um, is it common for pump manufacturers to provide specifications for quality assurance and quality control for construction and installation of their pumps? Is there some kind of ISO on this? Joe already answers, Ryan, pointing out that public domain pumps like the Afro Devon Rope Pump have standard specifications which are produced by SCAT or the RWSN Secretariat. Um, the reality is that most public domain pumps are manufactured in India and the standards are held within the, the India Bureau of Standards. It would be nice, maybe, Sean, if you could help to, to clarify. You had some suggestions about how to really improve pump standards, and maybe you could just clarify that again as to some of the ways that you see to move forward on that topic. Over to you, Sean. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, comes back to the, the, the point I made uh, earlier about getting information uh, back from the field about what uh, what's going wrong so what needs to be improved and also what do um, the people who are using the, the pumps what, what do they actually want how do they feel that the designs uh, can be improved to make it make it easier um, so that might one of the issues that's that's coming up in in one of the other themes of equity and inclusion for example is um, this making sure that water points are usable by by different vulnerable groups, whether it be people with with different disabilities or or the elderly or whatever, and so that there, there may uh, there's the possibility there that we of different hand pump designs or slightly slight variations um, to meet those different different needs. Um, yeah, there isn't there aren't any. Uh, Official ISOs. Some countries have uh, official um, standards, such as Zimbabwe with the, with the bush pump and Uganda with the U2 and U3 um, uh, pumps. Uh, but it's 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 an area that I'm keen to learn more about and really f pick up from uh, from you um, as, as people who are more expert than me, probably about what needs to be done and what what areas. Do we need to improve to make sure that these standards stay alive and stay stay useful and are applied? Because the one of the problems is enforcement, and that you can have these standards, but if they're not being adhered to by the manufacturers, then how is that um, going to be tackled? And I think one area uh, possibly is to produce um, a field note or, or or some some way of uh, Educating the the client, the the purchasers of as what to look for when they're buying when you're buying hand pumps. What should you be looking for in terms of hand pump quality and making sure that that, that what you've bought is actually uh, is actually what the standards say it should be. Uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Sean. I mean, one thing that um, I know Peter Harvey and UNICEF New York have been pushing for is to actually link the, per the pump purchase with the spare purchase and have the community buy the pump, possibly with a voucher. Um, I see you're writing in the box here, Anthony, and I got, you've got your hand up even. Do you want to add something to this around pump quality? Because you see this almost every day. Over to you, Anthony, with your mic on. Uh, and so yes, uh, turn, oh yeah, there you are. Great. Now, uh, the, the issue is that uh, they are standards. Even in uh, many countries, have standards of the pumps which they are supposed to have. But unfortunately, of course, where you buy the pumps, they have various qualities, and it is very easy for these different qualities, which probably sometimes are different from the standards to go to many sub-Saharan uh, countries, for example. Because one of the problems is that many countries don't have the capacity to test, to clearly check that this is the quality which, which is specified. The local uh, Bureau of Standards in many of uh, sub-Saharan African countries don't have 
they, they, they require the capacity to be able to check. And therefore, you find that pumps of low quality come in in these countries. And I think that is where the problem. I think Sun had mentioned that um, probably at the manufacturing stage, it would be so important to ensure that the, the quality that manufacturing is ensured so that then the, the products which come out don't have a lot of problems. But I think it is a very big problem. In you know, recent, we found that we even in national, in some of the places you have it's the same pump but a different qualities. Back to you, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you. But don't go too far, Anthony, because this next question is for you as well. Um, Hadari Kasim was asking for a, making a statement, but also asking uh, for a comment about the supply chains for spare parts and about the institutional linkages that are necessary in order for repair services to be delivered. I always have to put in a plug for our webinar recordings because I'd like people to perhaps go back to the Grundfos and Vernier Hydro webinars when we were introduced to a very different way of thinking about how uh, repair services and spare parts would be delivered through the private sector. But meanwhile, over to you, Anthony, for your comments on this question. Uh, yes, the supply chain for spare parts is very, very important. And uh, it's the only way to go if you have to have the pumps sustained because you need to ensure that there is a flow of spare parts and therefore you, you need to ensure that that is uh, done for right from the community level to, to where the parts are made. Now in the recent study where I was involved in the, with the IRC, uh, we found that there are quite a number of problems. Now one is whether the region where you are taking those spare parts, they, there is enough market because those are because the spare parts chain is governed by the market. Can you sell enough? Because that's what the, uh, the, 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 the business people want. It would be better if the business people are involved in the uh, supply chain of spare parts. But in some countries, for example, you find that the market for the spare parts is not sufficient to make enough profit. And therefore, you po probably need the government uh, to be involved in one way or the other to ensure that the spare parts supply chain works. Back to you, Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Anthony. And I'm just looking at the most recent comment from Lender to in Afghanistan, pointing out that in Afghanistan that the spare parts are organized through entrepreneurs and that the community is being introduced to reliable traders and how they can recognize the quality spares. It would be great to learn more about that. So if you could make contact with us and let's see if that's something that we could share with the wider membership because it sounds like a very interesting initiative. So the next question is actually to Marcus and um, you sitting in the World Bank have the, the big picture. And Key Kennedy from Cape Town asks, we would also ask who is learning the lessons we would benefit from the over exploitation of India's groundwater? It would perhaps seem that the arsenic and other things affecting groundwater quality would be a no-brainer that should be done before letting the non-experts loose, like happened in Bangladesh, India, and Canada. Can you tell us, Marcus, are there lessons being learned from what's been happening in India or what's still happening in India? Over to you. Yes, well, if we talk about India, I think we it's difficult to speak of a of a of uh, a similar situation. We have um, different parts of the countries, uh, of the country facing different problems. But we can say indeed that India was a, is a country where we observed rather quickly, uh, I mean, early in history, uh, overuse of, uh, over exploitation of a large number of aquifers. And to uh, the credit of the the Indian uh, authorities, uh, central and state authorities, we we have seen some kind of a, uh, a I mean, we have seen a reaction that was quite uh, effective in slowing down the over exploitation. So we can't say today that India has solved its um, Robert over exploitation question, but for, for due to a system they put in place where um, credit to small farmers was linked 
to the groundwater condition in the area, we saw basically uh, a reduction of new boreholes in areas where we were nearing over-exploitation. The, it, it immediately brings to the, the surface questions about equity, because it means that the poor farmers were not able to drill any more wells, whereas rich farmers still had that possibility. So there, there was, for sure, there were social issues involved. And as far as I'm aware, there is not necessarily a direct link with the, the water quality issues. That means lots of areas in India have seen deterioration of groundwater quality, like we see in Bangladesh. Um, where basically um, even new wells are being developed in areas where we have uh, arsenic problems, uh, like in Bihar, for example, where traditionally we had surface water systems and we are shifting to groundwater systems. So there is still need for um, uh, further uh, adjustment. Uh, there is still a, a big question of how effectively to to bring down at a, at a regional scale, for example, the, the groundwater where we see over-exploitation. And it brings us to very difficult governance issues. It's about political pressure, about voters not being happy to be to face restrictions in the, in the water use, of course. So um, I would say India has done a lot, but still has to figure out uh, some very uh, critical questions. So I don't think it's like uh, uh, necessarily the, 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 the example that would provide solutions uh, easily applicable, applicable to other regions. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that very clear answer. Now, before Elizabeth closes the, the, the webinar, I'd quite like to ask the participants, and there are 50 of you still online, if you could just kind of write down in the chat box what you think is the most important thing that you need to do to improve sustainable groundwater development. Um, and not what you think needs to be done, we don't need vague, but really what do you think that you and your capacity need to do to improve sustainable groundwater development globally or where you're working? Now I see there's some, Susan Davis has started to type, but I don't see, okay, so what do we have here? Joe's pointing out the, the book on what's happening in India, the political incentives. I have some more things on India. Elizabeth, spares. That's your main question, main point. Many people typing now. Bringing accountability to the people who are building projects. Accountability, a key aspect also with respect to the human rights to water, which is our next webinar on the 5th of June. Community participation, says Fatumata. Lindart, who's in Afghanistan, points out good recording of all the wells, well logs, and putting in a database. That's what you think needs to be done and what you are going to do. Uh, who's going to come up next? We've not got much time, so we have to type very fast because Elizabeth will stop us. Oh, Richard, getting, oh my gosh, so many coming now. Getting people to recognize the interlinkages between resource monitoring and management. Keith, training municipal managers, great. Business model, says Goose in Boston. Political will. Um, Nick, global groundwater assessment and regulations. Very interesting. We'll be looking forward to hear more about that. David Baguma, sensitized on water quality. Anthony, spare parts chain. So we'll see what you're going to be doing on that issue. Mike, design of sustainable models for implementation of low cost household solutions. Interesting work there. Kenneth, requiring local payments for service. Oh my gosh, Eric Miller, you've written so much. I can hardly read it. I think Elizabeth's about to cut me off at any moment. Procuring spare parts. Yes, but you can. <laughs> you oh, can there's so many. You all can keep chatting among <laughs> yourselves. Yes, yes, yes. You can keep typing, even though I ha I know no one will be listening to me, but still, I have to go through I'm gonna go the format there, of closing our webinar. And um, part of our branding is that we always start on time and we always end on time. So let me thank everyone. I think, um, Sean, you did a marvelous job. Thank you so much, Marcus. We don't usually make our discussants work as much as we did this time, but you did a, a really good job. And, and special thanks to Anthony, uh, because we know that you had to uh, go through 
many, many hurdles, jump over many, many hurdles in order to be with us today and get that wonderful microphone quality that you had. And then a big round of applause to Kirsten, who uh, was doing the question and answer period, uh, um, organizing that virtually on her own. I, I read out a few questions, but she was the one that was keeping track of all of your comments. So big round of applause. And of course, Kristen is always for managing this in the background. So uh, if you've registered for our webinar, you will be getting an email that has this green button in it. And if you click the button, that takes you to our web page. And on the web page, you will find the recordings of all of our previous webinar webinars. And in a couple of hours from now, you will even find today's uh, webinar recording there. And I, as I keep um, saying, uh, it's we're getting to the point where our previous webinars are very much informing some of the discussions we're having in our later webinars. So next week is uh, Katharina de Albuquerque talking about the human right to water and sanitation. This is a very special webinar series in the sense that um, Kirsten has been running a, and I guess Sean as well, running an e-discussion on the RWSN uh, chat group about this. And so they will uh, essentially be having the UN Special Rapporteur uh, reply to some of the discussion questions that have been happening on that chat site. And then, of course, as always, respond to the questions that you send us through the, the um, chat boxes. So please continue to tell people about what a great webinar series we have. We only have a few more left. So um, please get your friends and colleagues to join us here. And hope to see you next Tuesday. Good, goodbye.